Our um, first panel today is uh, chaired by John Snow. Uh, John is known to all of us. He's been the face of uh, Channel 4 News for more than 25 years. Uh, and uh, I have shared many personal memories of important events in our lives. The release of Mandela, fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, by the reportage that uh, um, John provided. Uh, more importantly, for this uh, particular meeting, uh, John has visited Iran frequently. He is very, very informed about Iran's current affairs, and uh, I think is um, one of the uh, journalists uh, that I know, foreign journalists that I know, who have uh, an incredibly uh, good understanding of how Iran actually works and what uh, being an Iranian really means. Uh, so uh, I'll ask him to uh, make the introductions of his uh, panel members. Uh, all I need to say is that uh, the British Museum and the VNA uh, have been our uh, longest, two, of the two longest uh, institutional partners at the IHF. We have been truly enriched by this partnership, uh, both at the VNA and uh, at the British Museum. We've held several exhibitions, uh, and we have. Uh, curators and um, uh, fellows uh, for the past many, many years at both institutions. So I'm very grateful to Martin and for uh, Neil to make avail uh, themselves available on a Saturday morning to sort this off. Uh, well, after John Curtis's, um, thank you very much, after John Curtis's um, pretty grim litany of what has happened uh, down the ages, you could have no better counterbalance, at least as far as British cultural understanding is concerned, than to have the directors of the British Museum in Neil McGregor and the Victorian Albert Museum in Martin Roth um, attending and speaking at this uh, conference. I should uh, clean my own hands when it comes to Iran. I've been conducting a stormy love affair with Iran for 45 years since I drove to the country overland from London in 1970. Um, and I mean, what became completely obvious to me as a student was that this was a, an exceptional and wonderful and extraordinary civilization, a remarkable country, a remarkable people. And that in a sense, if politicians, leadership across the world had understood the depth and extent of the Iranian civilization and its, its inheritance and the rest of it, then the way in which it communicated with it might have been um, different. Uh, and had it been different, uh, history might well have evolved in a very different way. We can only hope that humanity will catch up with the facts and get on and uh, relate in a civilized way with a great civilization. Um, because if we don't, uh, we, we, we are in peril not only of losing Iran's heritage, but of losing the last stable country in the region. And we need to relate. And the fact that uh, Iran has suffered the most draconian uh, sanctions, I think, that have ever been meted against any uh, country, uh, even including North Korea, um, is a very, very depressing reality. Uh, the transactional sanction is a grim and desperate eroder, not only of the heritage itself, um, but of the country's capacity to develop and thrive. Anyway, that's my beef. I've got rid of it. Uh, you won't hear any more trouble from me. Um, uh, but I am delighted to introduce uh, Neil McGregor from the British Museum. And I just want to say one last thing, because he gave me one wonderful experience. And that was, he called me up and said, listen, you need to be here at the British Museum in the Persian Gallery, 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. At 8 o'clock in the morning, a man wearing glo white gloves carried a box in, and there was the Sarah Cylinder, which the politicians had said would never come back, and which Iran's civilization, inheritance, understanding of, of uh, inheritance and, and our shared endeavors to preserve uh, had returned to the British Museum, which in, in, had trusted uh, the Iranians, not only to have it, to show it, to look after it, 
but to return it. And that was a very great moment and proved what all of us knew, which was that we could trust. Neil. Uh, thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by thanking uh, the Iran Heritage Foundation and uh, by in particular for uh, this conference, but also for years of enabling the British Museum and also the VNA, but uh, I can speak only of the British Museum, in presenting to the world through our exhibitions and through our publications uh, the inheritance of Iran. What I want to talk about this morning is uh, just I want to ask a few questions on a couple of topics um, to ask whether more can be done and then to finish on one particular question. Uh, John has uh, conjured the, uh, the, the depth of the problem at the moment. And the main difference, of course, between the crisis now in, across the Middle East and across uh, from that in Iraq uh, over 10 years ago is that then there were troops on the ground whom one could turn to help. And I think one of the real problems we've all found uh, this time around is that the, when the colleagues in Mosul make contact, there is nobody who can help them <laughs> at all. And the, the extent of that difference becomes every day clearer. It may be, I don't know, that this is an area where Iran might have a role to play, where there may in some of these areas be the possibility of Iran playing some part as um, the Iranian influence is great. But the lack of capacity to affect matters on the ground is very striking. The two other areas I want to talk about were really related to images that have become very, very uh, large in our minds. The image on the cover of this conference brochure of the uh, bridge at Isfahan with no water and the question of the damming. And I know that Professor Bouchala is going to speak later about the uh, effects uh, of uh, the rescue archaeology um, and in particular, um, of course, on the uh, excavations at Sivand. But I just wanted to wonder and to ask whether there might be more in the way of uh, international discussion, international cooperation on rescue archaeology for damming. It's an area where the British Museum has been very closely engaged in Sudan. Uh, as you know, there have been a series of dams on the Nile. Um, great debate in Sudan as to whether these are really needed for energy purposes. But, the, every, but in every case, of course, the damming of the Nile Valley means the loss of thousands of years uh, of records of human inhabit habitation. And very successful campaigns of international rescue archaeology have been put together uh, to work with the Sudanese authorities and to examine and to publish the results. And I don't know whether that could be something to develop in the context of the physical archaeology, um, the physical culture uh, now at risk because of the dams in Iran. But what I really wanted to raise as a question for this conference was the aspect of Iran's culture, which is perhaps I think, most important for us to understand. John has talked about our failure over the decades, over the centuries, to understand uh, the riches of Iranian cultural heritage. Um, and I talk about the intangible heritage of religious tolerance and of the capacity to allow different religious communities to flourish. Uh, because the other image that has rested, I think, in everybody's mind over recent months is the image of the Yazidis on that mountainside uh, with nobody to help them. And the systematic destruction of the intangible cultural heritage of so much of the Middle East um, with the Mandeans, with the Yazidis, with the other smaller religious traditions. We all know what's happening to the monuments of the great religions, the worldwide religions. Um, the Mandeans, the Yazidis, to take the two that have been most in the public eye, are, of course, much less known. Their physical culture, much less 
uh, admired, um, much more modest, but the tradition, one that is fragile and in great danger. And it is, I think, an area where Iran has a remarkable record um, of allowing refugees, both um, the Bandians particularly, taking refuge um, from Iraq in uh, Iran. The Yazidis, uh, the, the Iranian aspect, I think, called the Akhla al-Halq, um, the Akhla al-Halq, uh, al-Halq, the people of the truth, um, allowed and finding refuge in Iran. And I think this might be an area that we should talk more about in public, the, that this would fit in with an Iranian tradition. Um, but also whether there is, and this may exist and I don't know it, whether there is a concerted international effort or address to the preservation of these traditions and, of course, these people. So that's what I wanted to put on the table. Thank you, Leon. Very, very helpful indeed. And uh, now from the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, Martin Roth, who has a great deal of international experience, French, much. German, British, and, of course, in Iran too. Um, first of all, thank you, John, and thank you to Wyatt and John for inviting me and the foundation to support us. <clears throat> I have to say, I, I feel sorry. I feel slightly bit embarrassed this morning because I'm definitely not an expert. Absolutely not. Um, I'm enthusiast, but not an expert. And uh, I used to work in Dresden before. I was uh, the director general of the uh, Dresden collection, the Staatlichen Museen. Um, great team, great collection, but not so much support for this kind of engagement. Now I'm in London and I have a great team. And the team is here and I think uh, it's much better if Tim or Moya would sit up here. But obviously, I, uh, representing the VNA, probably I can help you in giving a kind of layout what it means in general. If you give me just five minutes to tell you a bit more about my very personal collection, my personal interest in Iran and how it started, maybe it helps a bit for our discussion. Um, what I think in general, also, um, in a way, Neil mentioned it, is that we have a lack of personal experience. You called it in one of your amazing contributions on the broadcast, the Iranian paranoia. And I think we, we don't know enough about what's going on. We don't have a personal experience. And that creates a problem. Like you, I wanted to travel to Iran in the 1970s. You made it, I couldn't do it because I was a few years later. Um, I had a Volkswagen, I mean, very personal story if you want to hear it. I had a Volkswagen bus, a very hippie situation at that time. And we uh, packed the, I mean, we arranged everything to start and then there was a warning coming from the foreign office. And I changed the direction and went to Norway. <laughs> And I was sitting on the fjord and reading books about Isfahan and Persepolis and Shiraz. And then I asked myself, where is my interest coming from? And I mean, it's, honestly, sorry for that. It's really very personal, very un-British. Um, I'm sorry for that. I'm, um, I wonder myself growing up in Germany in the 50s and 60s. I'm born in 1955, um, where this Persian love affairs, I mean, Paul called it in a Deutsch-Persische Liebeserklärung, a German-Persian love affair. And the others called it the Arische Achse, the Aryan Axis. So you ask yourself in that time, in that generation, what does it mean and where does it come from? And um, having had the chance a few years ago to see a car collection in Tehran, I've never seen so many Mercedes and Porsches on one spot. So there is this kind of, um, I mean, it's not only personal relationship, there is also a lot of economy. You know, you know it much, much better than I do. So that was the beginning of my interest. Where is this love affair or whatever it is coming from? The second part was then that I had the chance, I was in, in charge, one of five organized the first German World Fair, Expo 2000 in Hanover, 
It was not a success, definitely not, but I, and the color of my hair comes from that. Huh? But I learned a lot at that time. And we tried to work the very first time for World Fund, not only work to work with government, but also to work with NGOs. And I was in charge of the, let's say of the content of the exhibition conferences um, and 800 projects around the world on site. And I tried very hard to work with NGOs in Iran in creating a cooperation with partners on site in Iran, and it didn't work at all. I mean, I knew it before, but I thought it was worth to do it. And I had a lot of support at that time, and I still have it, from somebody, I'm sure you know him, Professor Dr. Majid Sami, neuroscientist based in Germany, and he supported our cooperation. That was one part of my interest. The other part, still talking about personal experience, the other part was that I received a phone call in maybe 2003 or four from an organization in Germany creating contact links to curators around the world. And they asked if we are, accept, if we are prepared to accept curators from Iran working as interns in Dresden. And sure, we accepted it, absolutely, I was happy to do it. And um, it was one person from, one colleague from the National Museum and obviously a curator from another institution. And finally, I learned it was not another institution, it was Bonyard, it was one of the foundations being in charge of the cultural heritage, the palaces of the Shah and much more. They invited me to come to Tehran, as you can imagine. I accepted that invitation. I was very thrilled to come to Tehran. And at several lectures, saw a lot, went to Ramsar, um, hikes on uh, the border to Azerbaijan, uh, Isfahan, Persepolis, learned a lot, saw a lot, met a lot of people, and didn't, didn't not at all understand why they invited me. Till I had a very unusual moment because they asked me in a very private moment, what does it mean for me to be in charge of 12 museums, an amazing collection in Dresden, in an institution that created a narrative in the Kaiserreich, means 19th century, in the revolution, 1918, in the Weimar Republic, in the Third Reich, in the communist times of Germany, in the Federal Republic and after reunification. How do you organize something like identity or national narrative, or however you will call it, this kind of disruptions and a, let's call it in a positive way, a zigzag of history, and it's definitely much more. Until that moment, I think I'm even more engaged in, with my interest in Iran and personal history because I think it's about creating something like um, a narrative for all of us and how we understand history and how we cope with history, how we can support each other. And the VNA's collection, I'm sure you know it, is one of the best outside Iran. It was founded and built in the 1870s. In 1876, Tim, I hope it's right what I'm saying, we showed the first Iranian art show in, at that time, still the South Kensington Museum, later the VNA. It was Robert Murdoch Smith who was the creator of that collection. And since that time, we have a very close relationship to Iran and Iranian partners. So whatever we can do to contribute in terms of expertise, corporations, I mean, we are happy to, and we is we, really the team of the VNA, we are happy to support it. But at the same time, I think we need a very, very personal relationship to friends and colleagues from Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want an opportunity for people to um, make points and ask questions, etc., from from the audience. So do feel free to uh, put up your hand. But uh, what I I think I was very excited about, but both exhibitions that at Neil stage at the uh, at the British Museum and the exchange which resulted in the uh, Sarah Cylinder was that these things were conducted when diplomacy 
was at its absolutely lowest ebb uh, when the British were specifically moving sanctions against um, Iran uh, and at a time when you would have thought it would be quite impossible to do anything at all. What was so interesting was that the cultural dimension in Iran uh, uh, expressed no vengeance, no resentment, no refusal to engage, uh, but in fact this life continued below the, below the radar, uh, approved, but, but not, not exhibited, but I mean not, not, not flashed, but it, it existed below the parapet and was fantastically holistic and complete. And as far as I know, just about everything you asked for, you got. And, just, and of course, what they wanted more than anything else, they got. How was that achieved in such negative circumstances? Uh, well, I think the, the circumstances of the, the first exhibition, the uh, Forgotten Empire, where we wanted to make the point that the, the Achaemenid inheritance is so little known, so little studied um, in the UK. Um, the circumstances uh, were that it was, uh, we went to ask for the loans uh, in Tehran the day after the looting of the museum in Baghdad. It couldn't have been a worse moment. Um, we knew that the Iran Heritage Foundation would support us in the venture, but um, we did not imagine that it would be possible to continue. And the fact that it did, and that these extraordinary loans, many things that had never left Iran before came to London, was of course entirely due to the years of work uh, by John and Vesta Curtis in building friendships and trust. And it is exactly as you say, John, um, a demonstration of the fact that in the cultural field at least, and I imagine the academic as well, the power of friendship is much stronger than the political upheavals and can, uh, it, it can't be destroyed and can easily produce results. Uh, when we went to see the, the, the minister that morning, uh, I ex expected the, the, the meeting would be cancelled. I expected that there would be a very uh, brisk rebuff. And the conversation made no illusion at all, uh, not just to the complex British-Iranian relations of the last 200 years, mm -hmm. but uh, even more important, um, nothing, no reference to the events of the last week in Iraq, simply said, this exhibition is being arranged by our friends and we will support it. Um, and I, for me, it was a revelation. Um, I couldn't imagine any European government minister um, making such a statement uh, in, at a similar moment. And it's why I think it's, it's, um, it's easy for those of us who have had the good fortune to have some kind of personal experience in Iran to be optimistic about how quickly things will be able to recover once the, uh, once the, once the, once the political climate warms. One of the things which, um, of course, you know, I don't know whether museum directors are in quite the same situation, but one of the things one has to contend with is propaganda. And in the end, if you're going to be uh, at diplomatic war with a country, you have to paint the worst possible picture of that country in order to sustain the support of the population. And one of the difficulties, I don't know about in Germany, but one of the difficulties here is that education, I mean, there is very, very little teaching of uh, the Persian, I mean, we talk about the Greeks, we talk about the Romans, but we get very little on Persia. Um, and yet, if we had had a lot on Persia, we'd have had something to build on. And I'm just wondering whether Germany does a better job of understanding, after you have a very large diaspora, um, or you know, in terms of Iranians living in Germany, um, is, is there a better attempt to inform people? For example, um, nobody in this country knows that or very few people know in this country, talking of religious minorities, knows that the largest Jewish population in the Middle East outside Israel is in Iran. Um, and uh, you know, th th these are awkward facts. They get in the way of needing the, uh, the entity to be essentially an enemy. Yeah. I mean, if this was the question, but it's, um, I think, it comes back to what I said before, it's about the personal experience. I mean, what I knew before and what I learned later when I traveled the very first time in, uh, in Iran 
but it's completely different. I think there are, there are a lot of misunderstandings. There's a lot of misleading information. There is not inf enough information at all. There is not enough in education. I mean, if it's about women's rights, it's about democracy. If it's about, there's much, much more to say. And I mean, it's always difficult to talk about it because if you are in public and you talk about it, it all sounds like defending something. Mm -hmm. But you are right. It's uh, again coming back what you call paranoia. Uh, everything that was related to what happened in Iran had this very bad, um, rebu bad reputation. But I mean, I, I think I can't, I can't prove it, but I do believe that some of the politicians that went to war in Iraq did not know the difference between Sunni and Shia. Um, definitely Islam. not, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, and the, the sanction makes it, make it even worse. I mean, I remember it was maybe 2008 or nine when the German ambassador called me, it was about uh, canceling a trip and I said, no, please come. You are the only one, I mean, you culture, you are the only one who can still come to Tehran. and please come, go back and tell what's going on. So I think it's much more than just being engaged, being something like a, a reporter, messenger, or whatever, mm -hmm. and I think we have to play that role. I mean, a little bit later, maybe I, if you give me the opportunity to say a bit more about corporations, because I think we miss a bit corporation in that field, but that's something we can discuss later. You wanted to add? Yes, I just wanted to, the, the point uh, you made, John, about propaganda and about the failure to understand the, as you say, aspects like the Jewish community still surviving in Iran, um, and the the, the role reserved, of course, the Christian populations and the Zoroastrian populations. Um, it was certainly, in my experience, one of the most striking things uh, accompanying the Cyrus Siddhant on the tour of the United States, the incredulity with which audiences reacted, um, uh, quite seriously unwilling to believe uh, that there were Jewish and Christian communities protected by law and by the Constitution. Uh, as well as the Russian ones in, in Iran. And it is about, I'm sure, about making this better. The main thing the Iran Heritage Foundation should do, of course, is actually make sure that Jon Snow appears nightly um, uh, uh, telling the world about Iran, and then the, the problem would change. That, but, that would only add but, uh, to some But the uh, one thing, one point that was very striking last week in the, in the wake of the whole um, Charlie Hebdo debates and crisis, um, much made, of course, of the, uh, all the European leaders joining, making pious declarations. As far as I can see, nobody reported the fact that President Rouhani, on the 7th of January, made the statement that we have to start with books in elementary school and teach our children to accept each other and see all religions as branches of a united tree. And this approach has to be extended to universities, to Islamic centers, and to theological schools. I mean, this is a, an astonishing statement was for the, the head of government of a country presented to us as intransigently and exclusively Islamic. And I don't know how one allows this aspect of the Iranian intangible heritage um, in to, be, to be better known. Uh, it is an extraordinary statement. I can't needless to say, I missed it. <laughs> that's, that's because you're not in daily contact with, with Vesta Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> I won that reference. So would anybody like to um, make a point or come in on anything they've heard uh, or would like to add to the sum total of... Yes. I think on a more... Is it working? Yeah. Just, just for the camera, because they're recording it. Can you just say who you are? Uh, I'm Abolala Sudaba. Uh, on a more general level, the interest in history and antiquity is sort of going down on a general level everywhere. Uh, people don't have time to um, delve into history, into past history. It's too complicated. Modern art is much easier to understand. So. Um, and in a way, I was very much struck by Neil McGregor's speech in, in the United States when he said that the uh, British Museum is a repository of world heritage on behalf of world heritage. It's not an English institution to uh, hold these items. So uh, I was wondering if this is a line that should be promoted that 
culture is something that is not really, um, that doesn't belong to a country. It, it's worldwide, it, it's a civilization, it's the inheritance of everybody rather than trying to preserve Iranian culture heritage, Syrian culture heritage, it says worldwide um, culture heritage and can this be promoted? Well, in a sense, that's what UNESCO is for, isn't it? But it's a bit of a weak, well, a nice, good things can be said, but nevertheless, it's, it's not a strong entity. Is that, I think, the, 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 the expression given to that idea is, of course, UNESCO. Um, but because UNESCO, of course, is a government organization, then precisely the problems that we encounter between nation, nation states uh, and, uh, go against UNESCO achieving its assertion that these sites are the sites of all humanity. And uh, that's one of the great sadnesses that, the, that, in fact, although it can declare the, the great world heritage sites as heritage for the whole world, when actually it comes to the administration of UNESCO, it's governments that are allowed to speak with the results you see. But Martin, you were going to say something about cooperation, and I don't know whether you, you meant nation to nation or whether UNESCO or, mm. or well, NGO or... I mean, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in, in alliances, in corporations, in sharing expertise, in sharing action, in learning from, from organizations with a completely different background. And I think we are not really keen on it. I don't know, I, I honestly, I don't understand what's the reason for it, but I mean, first of all, there's still a kind of egoism inside the cultural world, a very strong one. And then it's again divided into history and contemporary and so on. Instead of understanding the conflict, knowing the conflict, working on a solution. So that's a cultural field. Then, and John, I, I thought your presentation, your speech was amazing. I mean, honestly, I learned a lot this morning. And um, I mean, things I never wanted to learn. And, um, but what, what we, and I had the, I don't know if it's an opportunity, but I, I traveled with the German Minister of Foreign Affairs eight months ago to a refugee camp in Lebanon on the Syrian border. And what I learned there is, first of all, the, I mean, there's a competition of help organizations, but there's not enough knowledge. There's not enough education. There is not enough information. And working with help organizations, for example, the cultural world and help organizations would help a lot. Um, so it's, it's sharing information and working together on a strategy, and that's something I really definitely miss in those times. Chris, there's one, the, one very interesting point that came out of Robert Hillenbrandt's um, uh, very powerful lecture last night was precisely the danger of nation states appropriating cultures that were, of course, conceived in a world without them um, in the reconstruction uh, and the rebuilding of monuments, uh, uh, particularly Uzbek, Tajik, whatever, to conform to an idea of later national identity being transposed and rebuilt on the, particularly on the medieval sites. And it's a very, very serious question. And a question, again, interesting, in which UNESCO, of course, is totally conflicted because it has to protect the right of the nation state to do with its culture what it wants. And the, I thought some of those monuments last night that Robert uh, Hinnebrandt showed us raised this very, very acutely. Uh, Neil raised the question uh, that perhaps Iran had a role to play uh, in the possible preservation of monuments as a neighboring country and also as a country that has undoubtedly great influence in Iraq. I think there has been an input, the same way that um, the Iranian forces have been quite instrumental in fighting and securing certain parts, even on the side of the Kurdish Peshmergas. The problem is that it is not reported. 
And this doesn't mean that everything that is done is right, absolutely not. But the, the positive input that we see from Iran is absolutely ignored. The same way that, for example, when those um, uh, people in the Ebdo uh, um, incident were murdered, uh, in the Friday mo uh, prayer in Iran, the Imam Jome actually condemned terrorism and said it's totally irrelevant whether people are French, um, you know, European, Iranian, Syrian, or Iraqi. But why is the journalist world so one-sided and so unfair towards Iran? Well, well th th that is a serious point, but uh, I went in September to Iran specifically to try to report this activity by the Iranians in trying to retrieve areas that were under siege, particularly Khabala, uh, but other places. And um, lots of people talked to me and said, this is what's happening, but nobody would speak to me on camera and nobody would let me get anywhere near anybody who was involved. And I can understand why, but at the same time it meant that it was impossible to say, look, by the way, uh, the Shia minorities are being protected, Shia shrines are being protected, and there is even, although Norman disputes this with me, but there is even, I believe, cooperation between uh, aerial activity by the United States and activity by uh, Iranian forces on the ground. Um, there has to be. I can't see how you can bomb a town in which there are civilians trying to be got out by the forces on the ground without some degree of co cooperation. But here, that's just a journalist speculating. You just cannot get to the facts. And then because the propagandists can just say whatever they like, uh, you've got very little way of, of combating it. It is very, very, very difficult. There was another question here, and then, then we'll come to the front row. Yes, sorry, up, oh, come here, yeah. Um, yes, I would go, well, like to go back, sorry, both to the issue of propaganda you mentioned and the issue of education. These are sometimes at odds, and I'm sorry my <coughs> brother did not mention what he's written in the first pages of his recent book on Mithraism that he had heard from uh, eminent French professors that Sarkozy had definitely forbidden anything good to be said about Iran. That was probably at a time when America and Israel intended to bomb Iran and, <coughs> and they could. So uh, there is a conflict between the good intention of scholars and aesthetes like yourselves mm -hmm. to, to um, say the truth about history, to bring histories together, to bring cultures together, and the uh, propagandistic uh, attitude of governments at certain times in history. What can be done about that to separate, to separate the two issues? So much would have been different. I was in the embassy, the US embassy, the day it was sieged. It was taken by the, by the students. None of them expected the thing to go on for more than a few hours. Uh, and they couldn't believe that the Americans wouldn't, wouldn't talk. Um, you know, and, and once you got to that situation, um, you know, the, the, the propaganda uh, value in these wretched people, taking our diplomats, all the rest of it, all that, uh, the, for us on the ground, it was impossible to combat it because the weight of authority saying these beastly people have to, I, I won't, won't release, the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all you needed was somebody to, to say, look, okay, let's, let, let's talk. But it wouldn't happen because these outrageous people had, had done what they'd done. And, and in the heat of the moment, that was the end of it. And history could have been so different. There's a question here. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Before you, before you speak. Just, just very briefly. I mean, um, I just said a few days ago in a completely, in a completely different circumstances, we talked about the amount of disinformation that happens right now in the world. And I think it's not only about propaganda, it's disinformation on purpose. Uh, <clears throat> and I think culture and our background and our, the knowledge and expertise in our institutions helps a lot 
to come back to information. And, uh, but it needs, it needs a coordinated strategy. And that means for us here is grading exchange, bringing people together, working together on topics, in research, in conservation, in support. And it's not, it's not a question of hierarchy, don't get me wrong. It's more cooperation, learning on site, on both sides. Sounds probably a bit naive, but I really believe in things like that. And this is one of the purpose of our, of our institutions. The other thing was the article in The Economist, which I thought was pretty much a surprise. I mean, I'm sure we, you know what I, what I mean. Because this article was a bit, asked the question is, are we wrong? Have we done something wrong? Is Iran probably different from what we expected? Um, so obviously there is a change in, um, in journalism and reporting about Iran. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Whenever I visit Iran, I normally take my time and have a chat with Iranians. And I found that by talking to people, I found that the authorities have no interest in preservation of the Persian culture. And all their interest that is covered of mosques here and there. They have no interest to a Persepolis nor other places. I would like to ask panel, when they visited Iran, how did you find the authorities' opinion and attitude towards preservation of historical places? Uh, well, only I've limited experience, but um, because b working with the uh, ICHTO, and the, so the government authorities, very serious commitment, particularly to the archaeological sites, uh, to researching them and to conserving them. Um, very serious indeed. So I, I, my experience has clearly been very different from, from yours. Um, just slightly moving the debate away from the political elements, which can go on forever, having the directors of two of the world's top museums. Uh, can you give us some ideas about practicalities that can help? As you said, every inch of Iran has something that is worth preserving. And there are lots of stories that a local person might try to, you know, uh, mend the tile and their photographs that they, you know, put it upside down, etc. Are there, what can you do to stem this lack of interest in preserving the trades of people who can endeavor to preserve these monuments. Uh, you know, I note um, something that just comes up to, to my mind, the turquoise mountain, despite all the political baggage and contro controversies that is stirred in Afghanistan, it has made a small uh, dent in this um, a country that where local people no longer knew how to, the coppersmiths, the tile makers, uh, whatever, they are uh, finding one or two young men or women who are keen to learn the trade of preserving this. I mean, what can be done in that respect? That might, that's not political and could museums get together? Could there be training programs? Could, be, could there be funding? I know there is a tiny trickle of money to bring people over here, but much, not so much emphasis on the theory, but actually on the ground to teach these people, everyone, to, how to preserve their heritage. I mean, Neil, I think we share the same experience. When probably you please add if I am... Um, Forget something. I mean, it's business as usual, but we have to start this kind of business as usual. It means cooperation on conservation, means um, internships, means it's really daily practice. And I mean, the British Museum is very good in it. The VNA is not bad in it. We we have cooperations around the world. I mean, for years, but decades. Do you, have any, do you have any Iranians? But we presence? don't have exactly. That's the next step. But we don't have an Iranian presence right now, and I think we have to start it. And 
John started it, Maya went to, I don't Maya, maybe you want to say a few words, went to Iran half a year ago. Um, I think we just start again to work together and uh, using the, the, the very personal context that we had before. But again, it's not rocket science, it's something that we always do and always did. Much more expanded sense, bringing new technology. Absolutely, I'm aware of the internship of the, you know, once every three years, one person might come over, but much more concerted, united effort. But, but, but you see, although you wanted not to talk about any politics, yes. the very absence of the British Council, yes. which should be doing exactly this, providing scholarships, providing opportunities for internships, etc., etc., negotiating with British Museum, everybody else, etc., all that's dead. Dead not because we don't want to do it, but because we're not allowed to do it for political reasons. Um, and, and it would seem to me that as a confidence-building measure, the first thing they should do, if they can't open the embassy, heaven knows why that is, but anyway, there it is, if they can't open the embassy, for God's sake, open the British Council uh, and get on with, the, with the, those confidence-building measures, which are about cooperation in trying to preserve... Uh, the British Council is very, I mean, they're really very much prepared just to go back to Tehran. They have a team now, the team is trained, but it has to start, we have to do it. Um, sorry, I think you had a question. Yeah. Just coming up, microphone. My name is Seren Malikian, and you may have read my articles in the International Herald Tribune for 40 years, where I published them, uh, published a lot about Iran, and I was struck by the surprise around my uh, colleagues whenever I published an article about Iran. There was an amazement about it. And I think that fundamentally the reason is that all the Middle Eastern countries that are Islamic, that are Muslim, are all um, described by the, the non-starter Islamic countries, Islamic civilizations. Mm. This goes back to a very long tradition. I mean, the Muslims are the others, whoever they may be. So the unawareness of the strong cultural identity mm. of countries, far more different from each other than Germany's from Britain or mm. Britain from France. Mm when you take Iran, when you take Hindustan, India, when you take Turkey and, and the Arab countries. Yeah. And this Islamic denomination has absolutely drowned the identity of a country whose name is the oldest in the world on its own territory. Iran is the oldest name ever used by any nation. Mm -hmm. China uses a name much, much later in, mm -hmm. in history. India doesn't have one, uh, strangely enough. And that is completely ignored. And may I draw your attention to the fact that Western museums always have separate departments for the art of ancient Iran drowned among the Middle East and of Islamic Iran drowned in an Islamic department. If, you, if the Louvre <laughs> or the British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum, who, which all have fantastic collections of Iranian art, had Iranian galleries, the impact would be phenomenal. Okay. Just imagine what the Louvre could do with the, 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 the relics that they removed from Susa and Persepolis, and then uh, with, with the enormous Iranian collection, which actually makes up more than half of the Islamic galleries, but they all go down as Islamic art. Mm. No one would dream of having Italian paintings of the 16th century and German paintings of the same period uh, in the same room called Christian paintings. <laughs> <laughs> that is what is... <laughs> and that is what is done with Iranian art. Then people will say, oh, there are exceptions to figural art, there is Iran. They forget, by the way, that Turkey also is the exception, that India is also is the exception. But painting in Iran is completely different from anything that surrounds it, and that is simply ignored by all the cultural institutions. So might I suggest that museums in the future might consider perhaps the thought of having Iranian rooms. I had hoped to be able to do that in the, the Aga Khan Museum uh, in Toronto, uh, with which uh, I'm involved. Unfortunately, the Iranian collection is enormous and the other collections from Islamic countries are absolutely tiny. 
So in order not to give the impression that we were celebrating Iran versus the rest of the world, we couldn't have that Iranian collection. It would have been two thirds of the museum. But great museums like the VNA or the British Museum might perhaps in the future consider the idea of having Iranian galleries called Iran. And by the way, not Persian, please. I'm Iranian, I'm not Persian, I'm a Turkic speaker. So uh, Iran is made up of all kinds of speaking communities and the Persian speaking communities probably are not even the majority, although the, there is not a statistic on that. You have North Iranian language, you've got Arabic in the Southwest, you've got Turkic all around uh, Iran, including around Persepolis, where the Qashqai are Turkic speakers. Well, thank you for a really brilliant contribution. Um, uh, Neil, you're on the mat. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, the British Museum uh, does, of course, have uh, an Iranian gallery, thanks to uh, Miriam's family. Um, uh, but you're right, we distinguish, like all museums, we divide the history of the collections from the area of the Middle East, uh, somewhere around 700. That's, that's, there, is a, there is a reason for that, which you know far better than I. And given that collections have to be divided in different ways, um, that's, the, that, that's the way that most of, the, most of them are. Um, I don't know whether you were saying that there should be one Iranian gallery trying to tell the narrative of Iran from the beginnings up to today, um, or whether within the galleries devoted to the post-700 Middle East, there should be separate Iranian, Ottoman, in Mughal Indian, whatever galleries. That is, in fact, the case in quite a lot of collections, I think, that you can see there are separate, these are separate traditions within an overarching uh, community of faith. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a critical question. And in fact, it's one that we've been discussing very much in the museum at the moment. And how you divide the collections, how you present them um, is, is, is the key question. But thank you, thank you very much for that. Indeed. But I think your point leaks over into an understanding of the world today as well. I mean, for example, um, there are many people who tell me they, that the Persian women, Iranian women, cannot drive. Um, and I have to point out to them that not only can they drive, but that the universities have 60% women to 40% men, which comes as an appalling shock. Um, you know, there are so many modern facts that tie in with the points that you're making in terms of heritage and how we understand the whole construct of, 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 of the Iranian uh, heritage and culture. I think we've overrun John, haven't we? Do we have any more minutes? Can we have another three, four, five minutes? Uh, any, more points from the floor, because there were a lot of hands. Uh, Vesti, I'll have you in a moment. I'll let you wrap up in a moment. So why don't I come to you, and then I'll come to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much um, for not only very stimulating presentations, but, but fostering such a great conversation as well. I just wanted to say something about the um, problematic of Islamic art as the umbrella, and then the very dangerous potential for us falling into uh, nationalism and ethnocentric uh, attitudes towards what is and has always been an incredibly generous cultural posture on the part of Iran. If you look at the Achaemenid uh, Empire, it was not one that imposed its ideas about art on others, all those different regions that it, it conquered and administered, <coughs> but rather absorbed and brought it into the, its own fold and created a new identity. And I think this notion, it's partly really the, the contemporary problem, post-colonial, nation building, nation state building problem. I don't think anyone mistakes the fact that North, Northern Germans and Southern Germans may not get along quite as well either. But, but the point is to, to create these boundaries on the basis of uh, these national identities <coughs> will also be a disease that 
that is like many other of these diseases of today, all kinds of prejudices. And uh, as much as I think uh, the contributions of Iranian culture are central, I also think that it is not alone in the region and that there is something to be said about a culture of Islam to which Iran has, has given tremendous amount and, and is, it should be claimed. It's, it's ours. Why don't you pass the microphone back to the man who started this conversation? <laughs> I, I quite agree that Iran contributed to the culture of Islam and that Islam indeed, I mean, also revived Iranian culture, which was pretty decadent at the end of the Sasanian period. That is not the point that I tried to make. I'm just saying that the identity of Iran which is one of the strongest in the world, as strong as that of China, for example, is completely ignored by being washed down into an Islamic mishmash. And I repeat, you don't do that with Western European cultures. You have museums displaying Italian art, British art, German art, French art, and not mixing the, the paintings or the artifacts of one given period under the pretext that they are all made by Christians, which remains to be seen, by the way, at a given period. Right, let, let me get somebody who's presided over the management of uh, art in France, in Germany, and in Britain. <laughs> no, no, it's not, not, really, uh, not, not really France, but well, I think you, it's... it's um, you spent enough time there. I mean, uh, oh God, what do you say? I mean, uh, I think the only thing that helps is really kind of enlightenment and education and learning more about it and not believing that there is one exhibition that explains everything at the same time and then it's done. I think what we need is a series of debates, what we need is a series of, of exhibitions, what we need is a, a series of corporations. I mean, I had the great opportunity to be in Tehran maybe four or five weeks after the, the opening of the Cyrus Cylinder, still people queuing uh, in front of the National Museum. But so that impact was great, but at the same time, I think it was extremely important <coughs> what we learned about the cooperation here in Europe and especially in London. I think it needs a kind of debate on both sides. Um, I, I'm sure it's not an answer to your question, but it definitely needs more presentations, more cooperations, and more exhibitions, probably. About it. Um, that was a kind of very weak answer, honestly. Vesta, I'm going to call upon you, perhaps, to um, make the last contribution from the floor. Um, there is, I think, one other factor, and that brings together, actually, the whole question of identity. And that is that for the preservation of um, Iranian Persian culture, we are not just facing political sanctions and um, political misconceptions but we are also competing with the world in our neighborhood that has an enormous amount of money and spends this money very happily in order to create an identity and take the identity away from other countries and I'm thinking specifically of the Arab world and the United Arab Emirates. You may think that this is nationalistic. This is not. I think I'm talking as somebody who comes from that part of the world, but I am also a curator in the museum. Uh, we often have to fight to preserve the Iranian identity of an object of a historical event. And I think this is not right. Money should not buy culture. They are all entitled definitely to culture. But I think we as scholars have a special responsibility not to sell ourselves. Mm -hmm. Neil, did you have any? Uh, well, I, I'd like to thank you all for um, a really stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, you know, this uh, session, I wasn't quite sure how I wasn't quite sure how, how this session was going to go. It seemed to me one of these things where you light the blue touch paper and 
see where the explosions are. <laughs> and, and we've seen them in this room today. So thank you very much indeed. Right. I, I think uh, I share everyone's uh, view in this room in thanking this distinguished panel for sharing their morning with us. It was truly illuminating. And uh, I think there was a question asked, I didn't want to make a contribution then, about what the British Museum has done in terms of uh, um, people being coming to the UK, getting exposed to what's happening here and going back. I don't know if you know this or not, but the director of the National Museum in Iran, Mrs. Gorgi, actually was trained for a long time at the British Museum. And now, of course, she runs the most important uh, um, institution dealing with um, you know, our uh, past in Iran. And this relationship has been very personal. I think there is no way around this. If there is trust, there must be a personal relationship. Culture opens doors. And I don't think we should try to look for a wholesale solution to all of the problems that surround us. We should just take one element of one thing that we can do each day and try to do that thing. And we did that this morning, I think, by all deciding to come here and do this. This creates dialogue, conversation, understanding. That establishes trust. And then, one by one, we'll start uh, solving all of these wonderful, pro you know, innumerable problems that we have. Thank you, panel, very much. Thank you. <laughs>